Welcome to the weekend edition of the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. Uh, I do want to thank all of you first, um, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for praying for my father-in-law, Frank. He is um, off life support now, the breathing machine, the heart uh, machine. He's um, still on some others. I think they're still doing dialysis, and, and he's hooked up some to some other things. He's on drugs, but um, he's he's going to live, and it'll be a long path forward for him, I'm sure, but um, it, it does mean a lot when you when you say that you're praying for him, when you send encouraging notes in Christianity, if you really believe what Christianity teaches, um, we know that God does answer prayer, and he has in this case. Uh, he has spared my father-in-law's life, and uh, there's a church that depends on him. There's a family that depends on him. Um, so so thank you. I, I, I do appreciate your prayers uh, on his behalf. And they still don't know what caused this. Um, his heart just went into failure. He's an AFib issue, but it, it shouldn't have caused this. And uh, I know um, he, he. they say that he had a stroke during this whole ordeal, uh, which it shouldn't have been too severe, but they don't know the extent of it until he comes off the pain medication. So we'll uh, we'll find out. But, um, but anyway, thank you for your continued prayers. Um, uh, a few things. Uh, well, first of all, preview, and then, then a few announcements. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Neil Shenvey today, and I'll explain why when we get there. Uh, we're going to also talk about um, John MacArthur's friends, some like reactions to uh, his stand that he's taking, uh, which I, I found out now. Um, he's, he's got a star legal team. Uh, the Trump administration is very aware of what's going on there, and uh, you got some people that are connected to Donald Trump and the, the president that are going to be defending Grace Community Church. They're, they're trying to fine him $1,000 a day. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, just some, some, some things in the news, uh, some, some, some highlights that I just wanted to share with you. Some are funny, some are, um, so, some are a little more serious, but uh, just a, a bunch of accumulated smaller things, really. So, um, so, so we'll, start, we'll start there. We'll start with some smaller things. Um, number one. Wanted to, to tell you all this. Um, oh, oh, the quote of the week. I forgot. I was going to give you the quote of the week. This is from Paul Washer. Uh, someone sent this to me this morning. And I just thought this is a great quote. Uh, I wish I could put it on uh, the, well, really every church, just about. I mean, but, but you know, I, I thought, you know, this would be great if I put it, if we put it up on the church uh, slideshow, you know, for Sunday. Paul Washer said, some of you are mad about wearing a mask to church, but you've been doing it for years. <laughs> That's... Only the only Paul Washer can say something like that uh, and think think in those terms. I mean, it's it's uh, it's the shocking youth message all over. But um, but isn't that true? I mean, it's it's uh, it's so true. Some some of us, and he, of course, he's talking about masks in which we don't share who we really are because of fear of judgment or um, or we pretend we're something we're not. And so um, so anyway, I, I really I like that quote. Uh, so that's the quote of the week. Um, here, here's the little announcement I wanted to share. Uh, so this is about Patreon. I know many of you are aware of it, um, but I do have a Patreon, and uh, I don't talk about it a whole lot. I'll, I'll thank people sometimes for contributing, but it's uh, patreon.com slash worldviewconversation. The reason I'm mentioning it now is for, it, it's it's not even necessarily to, to raise money for me. It's really, the, the reason, I know this sounds so disingenuous, right? I'm bringing up uh, a page where people donate to my work, but um for those who want answers to questions, this is why I'm bringing it up. It's, it's really for your benefit. For those who want answers to questions, this is just, it's becoming more my way of um, uh, trying to manage the, the large load of emails and messages that I get. Because I do want you to feel like you can message me, but the reality is, at, at this point, I can't respond to all the messages. And I try, and sometimes it's like a, a sentence or two that I can give you. I can't um, get into the details of some sometimes the the paragraphs that, that I'm sent and so um, so I do try to read them or at least skim them and I do appreciate them um, but if you have specific questions and you really want answers there's two things you can do and one of them is patreon you can become a patreon of mine you can communicate with me over the app patreon app and I'm sure to get back to you if you're a patron on patreon app so I mean I have probably five different apps and email services, et cetera, maybe more than that. I haven't counted them all where people will communicate with me or try to at least. And I, um, Patreon is, is, is high on that priority list. Um, so, so that's just a way that if you really want to get in contact with me, become a patron and, um, and I can certainly give more attention to, uh, whatever question you have. Um, I will try to get back to you even if you don't, but it may, there may be a big delay 
Uh, and in some cases it might not happen. Sometimes things fall through the cracks. So I just, I had a lot of people emailing me uh, this last week or sending messages. And so I just wanted to, to let you all know, um, if you want more of me, more of my opinion on things, then that, that is a way uh, that you can get that. Um, so that's, that's one of the benefits of being part of Patreon. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention is uh, that, oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. The other way uh, that you can access more of my opinion is live broadcast. I'm going to try to do more live Q&As. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of a hit or miss, but if you're in channel on a Q&A session on YouTube, then you can ask a question and I, I may give it more time. Uh, so those are the two ways. Um, next, uh, resources. Uh, we need resources, right? We all know this. We need resources. More and more resources need to be produced. And so, um, of course, I'm, I'm doing what I can. I mean, I have, a, I have my own business that I run, uh, that I need to run to be able to, to pay for living. Um, I, uh, of course, the priority has steadily, I wouldn't be making this video if I wasn't um, getting support from you guys on Patreon, but uh, steadily, I've shifted more of my emphasis to this kind of stuff, creating content, um, producing books, etc. So, uh, so I'm doing what I can, but we do need, we do need a lot of stuff. And, um, some of you have sent me some, some really good resources, things you've written. Uh, I know several laymen who are trying to write responses to this, which it, it, in my mind, it's sad. There should be great big organizations, but I, I think there's a lot of fear. So, um, so laymen who want to take on, you know, let's just say that you, you read um, uh, Generous Justice by Tim Keller. I know there's reviews of that already out there, but you, you want to write a review or you're, you want to write a review of another woke book of some kind, uh, then you can send it to me. That, and this is really the announcement is if you have a resource, you think it's good, uh, contact me. Um, those who are my, my patrons know this. You, you can just send me whatever it is you have. And, uh, and I'll look at it, and if it's good enough or if it can be edited and, and modified um, for the format that we need, uh, we'll, we'll pu publish it. We'll put it somewhere. We'll archive it. And I am creating a list of resources uh, for people. So I think that's very important. Uh, so that's, um, that's uh, in response to an email I got this morning of someone just saying, I wish I could do more. And I thought to myself, you know what? There, there's actually a lot of things that you can do, and, and I'm blessed to have a platform where I can get some of this stuff out there. In fact, earlier this week, um, a pastor, you can go to worldviewconversation.com, or maybe it was last week, there was a pastor uh, who reached out to me and said, I, I wrote this response to Jonathan Lehman. I haven't really seen anyone else taking this angle. Would you publish it? I said, of course, it was well-written. Uh, it's a good resource. And normally I don't think he would have that kind of a platform, but I have a little bit of a platform. So I would love to platform some of your stuff if you have good resources. Um, so, uh, on that same vein of uh, resources, uh, here are some books. I, I oftentimes don't mention the books that I'm reading, and I probably should. If you're uh, if you're a friend, I don't know how it works. If you're connected somehow to me on Goodreads, you can see what I'm reading and see what I've read, and what I sometimes I'll put what I think about it. Um, these are just two recent books uh, that one of them I read, one of them I just started. But uh, the first is Ronald Radish called Commies. A Journey Through the Old Left, the New Left, and the Leftover Left. I think this was a very entertaining book myself, and partially because he's talking about regions in which I grew up, or close to regions I grew up in, and so, uh, so I might have a personal affinity to it, you might not. And this doesn't answer everything that's going on in the church, but it, it through a bi biographical format, it gives you kind of a... Um, uh, kind of a sense of what was going on in the New Left uh the movement throughout from the 50s really to, or really he goes a little before that, but his experience is mostly the 50s through probably the, the early 90s. And it it just, there's so many parallels. It just, I mean, this is the foundation. This is uh, the stuff we're dealing with today in evangelicalism. I mean, it, it comes from this stuff. And so it's just, it's really interesting. It I, I, People ask me all the time, you know, John, how do you think through these issues? Well, I, I I read. I, I try to read articles and I read um, books and and uh, and so this is just one that I, I read this week. Another one that I started, which really honestly seems like an excellent book. I, I think Roger Scruton really understands conservatism like well. Uh, he's not a neoconservative. There's a lot of people that claim to be conservatives, and um, you know, maybe I'll do an episode someday. I'm more of the when I think of conservative, I think of like the Russell Kirk conservative mind. Uh, kind of the Burkean conservative, and I think Roger Scruton is in that tradition. Uh, so reading him is kind of like reading like a Richard Weaver or a David Wells, 
Um, it's it's insightful. It's he, he understands kind of the issues at play, and he can get behind them. Uh, he's not sucked into new left assumptions. So I would recommend that uh, to you, Roger Scruton, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. And I think it really will help you understand kind of the times we're living in now. Uh, because honestly, here's the thing. The, the critical theory, I mean, that, that's getting all the press, critical race theory, intersectionality, these are new terms to a lot of you, but these are repackaged old ideas. And, and that, sometimes it's a little frustrating to me, I'll be honest, when um, people want to get highly technical about this stuff. And, um, and I understand there's a place for that. Some people are good at that too. But to me, this is, it's the repackaging of postmodern and communist ideas that have been around for a while. These are Marxist concepts. And, and they're being used in a Marxist way. And there's, of course there's differences. Of course, uh, things change over time. And, but but the, it, you know, it's like taking a, a, a new engine, putting it in an old car. <laughs> Critical race theory uh, is, it, it is a form of Marxism. It's a sect. It's like when you look at religions, right? Um, and of course, in Christianity, we have a revelation that is solid and secure. So true biblical Christianity does not change. But there's a lot of religions that have a progressive rev revelation kind of element to them in which um, things do change. And con there's contradictions sometimes, and there's new... Uh, and, and, and so th this is kind of like that. You know, critical theory, uh, today's version of it, which won't be the same version in 10 years, it's, it's, it traces back to, to Marxism, but it, uh, it, it's changed somewhat. It's developed. We're downstream from that, right? And so, um, so I like to understand the full stream. I like to understand the lake it came from, the stream that it's in, and where it's going, right? And, and people who on, only understand one little segment of that, uh, I think, aren't going to have a complete view. And it's very important uh, to understand, I think, the full picture. So these are some books that I would recommend uh, to you. Um, so a uh, little food for thought there. Now, let's talk a little bit about Neil Shenvey. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why I, I want to talk about Neil. Um, so, so, so I'll start it off this way. I had In, in the last podcast, I had mentioned that uh, Ed Stetzer is doing this White Fragility series on Christianity Today. And I just I mentioned that this is this is weird because this is kind of like um, doing uh, you know assuming that white fragility is somehow up for debate that Christians can disagree on this or can have fruitful conversation we can draw insights from it um, and and that this isn't something to go after each other on because different Christians come down in different places it's a secondary issue which I really think that's why he's doing it he's trying to show that white fragility is a is a secondary issue. And, and I don't put it in that category. Uh, this is c coming from a, a, it's a Marxist worldview. I don't have a problem saying that. It's a, it, this is a false religion. And it's a primary issue. Um, we wouldn't do this with the Book of Mormon, right? And Neil Shenvey actually compares the two, which is why I'm comfortable now <laughs> using that. Uh, we wouldn't get all the Christians together and go, well, who, who has insights from the Book of Mormon and who doesn't? And we're not going to go after each other on this. We're not going to point any fingers. We're just going to have this discussion and it's going to be fruitful. Well, no, if you're going to do that on Christianity Today, it would be the Book of Mormon is wrong. We're starting with the assumption that this is heresy, this is evil. Neil's doing this thing on, uh, he contributed to this, this uh, Ed Stetzer Christianity Today thing on white fragility. And I just commented, it's, it's interesting how Neil gets into these spaces. He's platformed by big evil leaders. Um, and I mentioned how he was at Southwestern and Southeastern speaking. When I happen to know that people that uh, would be critical of, of critical theory, et cetera, uh, were essentially... Um, or let's just say those institutions didn't really want them speaking. <laughs> and, but Neil gets in there. And so it, it's just interesting to me. I'm like, why, why is that? Why? And I asked that question. And I, I asked it because I wanted people to think about this. What is it that uh, keeps people out of the guild and makes someone like Neil Shenvey acceptable? And I had uh, a few people reach out to me and say, what's the problem with Neil Shenvey? I, I really like his stuff. And praise God, that's great. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't have a personal problem with Neil Shenvey at all. In fact, in fact I liked his, his personality. Um, he's, you know, he seems pretty straightforward, even keeled kind of guy. And, uh, and we've interacted on Twitter some, uh, I think mostly in disagreements, but I think there, there have been some nice interactions where, uh, not that the disagreements weren't nice, but there have been some positive interactions where, you know, I'm agreeing with something he says, but, um, 
overall, uh, is Neil Shenvey's role in this helpful or hindering? And I don't know if I if I can answer that question, um, because he's he seems to be kind of like statements uh, a statement of faith. Statement of faiths are very helpful in defining where someone's at, but they become shields at Southern Baptist institutions now. Uh, you, if someone's accused of liberalism, uh, like a Matt Hall, you know Al Mohler shows him signing the abstract and principles. Same with Danny Aiken and Walter Strickland. I mean, that's their go-to is look the statement of faith. And so it's become a shield. It's not, it, which in a sense, it, it hinders at this point. Because you, you, know, you, you know that they believe things that actually contradict the thing that they're signing. But because they're signing it, it's held up as, look, they, they agree. They're, they're on board. Uh, so you're the one that's divisive. Neil Shenvey, um, I think, has been used, whether he knows it or not, um, I think some of these institutions have used him to say, look, see, we're against critical theory. We had Neil come and speak about it, right? And and so one of the things that Neil doesn't do, which others like myself do do, is Neil doesn't really name names in big evangelical circles as much. Um, sometimes I think he might go after someone, but usually it's kind of, it's it's the farm league types. He doesn't go after the big, big Eva guys, right? Which And I, and I don't have a problem going after them all day long if I have to. Uh, truth is truth. I, I don't you know, care. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you, you could be, you know, a, a great guy and, and done many great things, but if you're going to go down this road and lead people down it, I'm, I'm going to have to say something about it. So, so Neil is, he's more, um, politically beneficial for some of these guys, I think, because he's not going to go after them. He's not going to go after Danny Aiken, but then Danny Aiken can platform him and say, we're against critical theory. So, so, so here's, so the the Neil Shenvey file, if you will. <laughs> Here's, here are my thoughts on Neil, and I'm I'm gonna expand this so you all can see it. Um, first of all, I gotta say I'm grateful for his research. I really am. I'm grateful that that he's trying to because look, we need resources. I just said that, and Neil is really t- p- taking a lot of his time. And I don't know if he's getting paid. I mean, I with a guy of his credentials, I would think he'd be <laughs> getting paid somewhere for this. Um, cause it, you know, doesn't pay to homeschool your kids. Usually they don't have any money <laughs> except the money you give them for allowance, but, but he's doing all this research and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's helpful. He's, he's looking at these books, these books on critical race theory, but that, that is not his specialty and it doesn't have to be, but, um, but, but that's, that's something that, that he's taken up recently. And, um, but, but here's some of the things that concern me. He is a member of Summit Church, right? Which is J.D. Greer's church, the flagship church for the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, J.D. Greer, uh, we, we've done some videos. You can go check the YouTube archive uh, where I've commented on J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer is not a conservative, not at all. Um, he is subversive. And, I mean, God whispers about sexual sin. Uh, you know, he wants to get rid of all hierarchies. Uh, very much on the caring well stuff. Um, very much on the, uh, I mean, he said what Black Lives Matter is a gospel issue. And I mean, the list goes on and on for J.D. Greer. Soft peddling or homosexuality, uh, turning Romans 1 on its head. And and so Neil Shenvey is a member of this church. And I have to ask myself, I mean, this church is has, a, has really gone down the woke path hard. How in the world can Neil, if he is so against this stuff, how can he still be there? I mean, there's a tweet um, that, uh, maybe I have it on another slide, but J.D. Greer is basically saying, yeah, Summit Church is Neil Shenvey. Neil Shenvey uh, and Summit Church, they're, you know, they're connected. And this was just recently. So there, it's not like Neil has gone anywhere. Uh, he's still with Summit Church, uh, according to J.D. Greer. So, so he's a member there. Um, that just it just raises a, at least a yellow flag, if not a red one. Where's your discernment level on this stuff? You're, you're going to be an authority on it, but you're going to a church where a pastor that's one of the worst abusers of this is your spiritual shepherd. You're putting your kids and your wife under his pastoral care. And if you're so concerned about critical theory, I don't, I don't understand why you would do that with a pastor who's pushing aspects of that. So. Um, like I said before, Neil has spoken in various venues where dissenting voices have not been permitted to speak, including Southeastern and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminaries. That's very true. Uh, he promotes a narrower focus, I think is one of the reasons, uh, to specifically challenge more orth- orthodox proponents of critical theory. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that he's um, he's taken the definition of critical race theory, theory or critical theory in general. He, he kind of 
he he's more of like a sniper. He kind of uh, he he'll zoom in and in his scope on those who are more purists. You know, they're really advocating the critical race theory stuff, and he'll he'll go after them. But someone who's more of uh, uh, syncretistic, who really likes aspects of it, wants to use it as an analytical tool, but doesn't like all of it, he's not as likely to go after them. And so this gives you know a pass to guys like J.D. Greer. Uh, and, and that's, I think, part of the danger of this is that's how this stuff gets in. It doesn't, you know, it's not someone coming, your pastor saying, I believe in critical race theory. Most pastors are going to deny that while promoting the new left critique, uh, the idea that we need reparations or some kind of a redistribution, whatever that looks like. Uh, promoting uh, the lamenting session, standpoint epistemology, the list goes on and on. We've talked about it on this channel. So here's a here's a tweet. Um, uh, this was a tweet I really appreciate. So I want to really get this off on a good foot. I just want to show you, I do appreciate some of Neil's research and some of the things he said. This is one, one thing he said that I did appreciate. Jesus devoted little, if any, of his ministry to dismantling unjust systems and structures. He spent nearly all of his time preaching the gospel, teaching and doing good works to individuals. We don't live in first century Israel, but his model is still relevant to us. And I think that that's a relevant thing to say. Yeah. Jesus did live in a, in a system, uh, in a place where there, there was abuse. I mean, he lived in an occupied country. And you want to talk about colonialism? He lived at a time when there was slavery. You want to talk about slavery? He uses it in some of his parables. And, and of course, J.D. Greer's response, I'm not even going to go over it. It's, it's just, it's, uh, it's not a very, again, you read his response. I'll just read it. Uh, the greatest so societal revolutions from the Bill of Rights to the abolitionist movement. So the Bill of Rights apparently, would, that wasn't a societal revolution. That was a conservative move back to rights that uh, England, that the king was not defending. But anyway, uh, came from Christians applying the biblical worldview to the public square. As Abraham Kuyper said, God wants his truth proclaimed everywhere. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that revolutions are, Christians are the ones that are behind revolutions. Um I don't, I don't understand why Neil Shenvey goes to Summit Church exactly if he's so against critical theory. But, uh, but that's J.D. Greer's response. So it's kind of a, uh, it's a yes, but yes, Neil, but don't forget about this. Uh, so here's some of Shenvey's endorsements. Um, here's uh, Danny Aiken. Uh, Danny Aiken said uh, the incompatibility of critical theory and Christianity, a very fine, worth taking time to read article by Neil Shenvey. So. So he, he likes what Neil Shenvey's putting out there. Uh, this is from day one. Uh, this was, I think, what was it, 2018 maybe when, when Shenvey put this out or the beginning of 2019? Uh, Keith Whitfield, who was on the resolutions committee that gave us Resolution 9, he's now I think the provost of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, said, yeah, Neil Shenvey uh, has provided us a helpful and accessible overview, a fair analysis and faithful guide to engaging contemporary critical theory in our culture. So he likes Neil Shenvey. So it's an interesting thing. Why would Keith Whitfield on the Resolution 9 committee, love Resolution 9. I mean, I have all the screenshots uh, for when that took place, but he likes Neil Shenvey. Dan, Danny Aiken likes Neil Shenvey. Um, and, and of course, Walter Strickland teaches at that seminary, the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, Shenvey, uh, like I said, is a member of J.D. Greer's church. Shenvey has defended Greer as a conservative. So, so here, here, here's what he says, um, and he's talking about J.D. Greer here in the context. Would being one of the original signatories of the Nashville Statement convince you that he, meaning Greer, is not the head of the progressive wing of the SBC? So Shenvey's saying, look, you can't sign the Nashville Statement and be a liberal in response to uh, this uh, Tim Dukeman, uh, who's saying, look, Greer could stop promoting liberals at the convention level. He could retract how the fall affects us all. That's his sermon on Romans 1. He could stop practicing as much egalitarianism as I can get away with without blatantly defying the Baptist faith and message. And that was Neil's response. Well, yeah, he signed the Nashville Statement. So I guess that makes someone a conservative if they sign the Nashville Statement. Uh, not necessarily. You, you can still sign things. You can still, and this is the problem with statements of faith uh, sometimes. Uh, you, you have to hold people's feet to the fire. You sign this. Why are your actions then in contradiction to this? If, if you just you know, give someone the benefit of the doubt and read uh, their actions through their, the statement that they signed, then you're going to get it wrong. Look at their actions. Look at their actions. Look at their works, right? You say you have faith, look at their works. But, but Neil's here, I mean, he goes to the church. He knows what's going on. He's not ignorant of what J.D. Greer, he sat under J.D. Greer's preaching. 
he sat under the sermons where J.D. Greer is soft peddling homosexuality. But he says, oh, no, but yeah, but he signed the Nashville state. Well, um, Shenvey also supported Resolution 9. Here's what he said. Uh, the resolution on critical race theory and intersectionality is careful, charitable, and nuanced. I hope it passes. You don't get much more of a recommendation of an endorsement than that. He, he endorses Resolution 9. He likes it. And you just got to think to yourself, you know, this is, this is a guy who's, you know, out there combating critical race theory, producing stuff, combating it, but he likes Resolution 9. The, it should make you scratch your head at least a little bit. Um, Shen v also states that critical race theory is not Marxism, which is, now I got to say, I, I want to say this. We all grow. We all learn. I mean, I've said things that now I look back and I'm like, you know what? I've, I've learned some more since then. I, I wouldn't have phrased it that way, or uh, I would have added this to it, or I wouldn't have said it, right? And, 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 and hopefully Neil Shenvey is learning and growing, and maybe even if he sees this, hopefully um, he, he sees it as someone who is acting in good faith, uh, who appreciates some of the things he's done, but, um, but has a hard time recommending him and wants my, um, the people that, that follow my channel, I, I just want you to be aware of some of the things that, um, that Neil has said that, that at least should cause some pause. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the tone, that's my attitude towards this whole thing. Um, but I, I want Neil to, to grow and learn. So Neil this morning in his article for Ed Stetzer's White Fragility series on Christianity Today, he actually says that D'Angelo's ideas are rooted in Marxism. <laughs> so he says that th today. Maybe he's grown because uh, this wasn't that long ago. This was this year. This is March of this year. He says, Resolution 9 did not say that Marxism is useful for understanding the world because CRT is not Marxism. You can't just redefine terms this way. Most critical race theories reject the central components of Marxism, especially historical materialism. And th this is where... This is where I, I get frustrated sometimes with people, where they don't see the lake, the stream, and where it's heading. Where is, where is, where is it washing into? Um, they see one aspect of it. They see the stream, and they say, well, the stream's different than the lake. Lake doesn't run. Yeah, well, but they're both water. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah, there's different properties to the stream and the lake. Yeah, there's different things living in the stream than in the lake. Yeah, the, it's a different temperature. Yes, of course, you can do different things in it, but it's the same substance. And, and it, we're downstream from Marxism, but it's the same car, different engine. It's modified. It's a souped up Marxist car is what it is. And so I think he understands that more now, but up until March of this year, he's still saying, yeah, uh, that critical race theory is not Marxism. That's, I don't know, like <laughs> Jonathan Edwards thinking was not Calvinism. You know, it's not because he disagreed with Calvin here and here. Yeah, but Look, we understand when we use the term Calvinism what we're talking about. And Jonathan Edwards stood in that tradition, just like critical race theory does. Uh, Shenvey uh, supported, uh, supports using, or at least did, I hope, I mean, this is la just last year, so um, this is not even a year ago, supported using critical race theory and intersectionality as analytical tools. And this is probably why he liked Resolution 9. And here, here's some things he said. Um, I know how critical theory treats critical race theory and intersectionality. Uh, hence my warning that critical theory is a dangerous and false worldview, right? That we agree with that. But then he says, but like geometry, it's possible to abstract tools from the worldview that produce them. If you disagree, why use any scientific tools or medicine developed by avowed naturalists? Or take the example I provided in the article. If a Christian argues for the need for an unwed mom's ministry at his church, dis distinct from their singles ministry and mom's ministry, he is in fact using intersectional analysis. Is this analysis useful or not? And uh, I didn't put my response there, but I did respond. And essentially my response, you can go look at it. I, I, all the links to these tweets are in the info section. Um, but essentially I'm saying, look, this, that, that, that's based on, intersectionality is based on level of oppression. And, and you know, you're, when you see a need for a nursery, you're not doing this based on level for, of oppression. And you're not using standpoint epistemology to figure it out. Um, you know, th this is actually pretty bad, to be honest with you. This is someone who's supposed to be an expert on critical theory. And he's saying that it's dangerous, but it's like geometry. No, it's not. Geometry, math, the principles um, of logic, these are fundamental to reality. You can't escape them. You can't contradict logic without using logic. You have to. So these are fundamental things that God, God's given us. They're in the natural revelation. Uh, critical race theory is not. It, it, it exists in the imagined minds of sociologists. 
And then, and Shendi is comparing these, like uh, something that is intrinsic to reality is the same as some abstract set of principles that some Marxists came up with. No, they're not. And, and this is where I'm like, why, how, how is someone, um, how is someone using uh, someone like this as an authority when they can't get that right? Now, maybe he's right now. Maybe, maybe he's understood now. Okay, there's a big difference here. Um, but no, you can't use these tools. You can't, these, these tools fundamentally rest upon assumptions that contradict Christianity. Uh, it's not like math. Math doesn't fundamentally contradict Christianity at its base. Uh, he says, I wonder if we could make this into a syllogism. Intersectionality is the idea that our identities are complex. It can, no, it's not. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not what intersectionality is. There's more to it than that. It's not just that our identities are complex, is that there's overlapping identities uh, that of oppression. That's specifically what intersectionality is about that need political representation. It's all about a politics and identity politics specifically. So he says that's the first part of the syllogism. It can be useful to recognize that our identities are complex. Therefore, intersectionality can be useful. Which do you deny? Shenvi is arguing that intersectionality can be useful. August 16th, 2019. This is the guy that's supposed to be helping us navigate critical race theory and intersectionality. He's arguing for using it. Now, I don't have words for this. I, I don't understand. Um, I don't understand why he would do this, but it makes sense now why he support Resolution Nine. Uh, he also defended the use of the term social justice as potentially meaning biblical justice. Now, to me, this it's not a big deal. I don't want to, you know, just nitpick. But this is for someone who's supposed to be an expert on this stuff. It muddies the waters. He says social justice could mean biblical justice applied to society. And I think he's defending a Joe Carter piece, if I'm not mistaken here. Um, but again, why, why go that direction? Why, you know, yeah, I guess someone could use that. But it's like, you know, there's, it's a term that is being, that has a wide use. And people who hear it today, they, they have a certain conception. So why would you go ahead and use it? You, you, you probably shouldn't. Um, and and Shenvi even says, you know, I don't actually recommend using the term social justice. That's wise. Um, but it seems like he wants to kind of defend people who would use it. Really, the, I think the proper response would be like, hey, look, I understand you want to use this term, but here, here are the origins of this term. Um, he, here's why the, here's how this term is commonly used, and here's why you may not want to use this term, or you want to think twice about using this term. And it's okay to say, yeah, there's people who might use it ignorantly. I get that. I understand. I understand. This isn't a big deal, but it just this is someone who's supposed to be an expert on it. So that's why it's just weird to me because it, it just muddies the waters a little bit. Uh, he also misrepresented Tom Askell's position on Resolution 9. And I asked Tom about this, and he verified it was a misrepresentation. But he, you know, he, he says that Tom Askell accepted, um, or those aren't his exact words. He didn't say the, the word accept, but that, that if Tom Askell's, um, uh, that the resolution or the, the, um, the proposal that he had put forward to amend the resolution, if his amendment was adopted, that Tom Askell didn't have a problem with Resolution 9. And he said that on a show. And so I, I kind of confronted him on this. I said, I like your personality a lot, brother. Um, I'm also grateful for some of the work you've done in, in cataloging quotes, etc. I think there are some on our side of this debate who are perplexed. You don't make some of the logical connections we see as obvious. And I still feel that way. And so you can see I, I put Shenvi's trying to defend this. Um, and he says that Tom Askell added an amendment. It didn't pass, but it, want, but it wanted to add one more whereas where he said, look, this is based on a godless worldview and it got rejected. My only point is that presumably, presume, that presumable, if they had passed the amendment, the rest of the resolution was okay. Keep in mind, he's not saying the entire thing was garbage. He's just saying, if you added this one sentence, he posted it as a friendly amendment and it said something like, whereas critical, race, uh, critical theory is based on a godless worldview. He says, my only point there is that he didn't argue that the rest of the amendment was false. He's saying, I want to add one more thing. And then presumably if that one amendment was added, he would have accepted the entire thing. And I think Al Mohler said the same thing. So, so he's, he's, he's um, misrepresenting Tom Askell here because what Tom Askell was doing was he was, he was actually introducing a resolution. He called it a friendly, friendly uh, or not a resolution, an amendment. He called it a friendly amendment. But this amendment was kind of like a poison pill 
which I know Shenby tried to say, well, that's not a friendly amendment. But I think in, in probably, and I, I'm guessing at this a little bit, but in Tom Askell's mind, I think it was friendly because it was true to Baptist faith and message, biblical understanding, etc. And I think that's why Tom Askell said it's friendly. I'm trying to get us back to orthodoxy here. Uh, that's, a, that, that's always a friendly thing. But what his, his amendment did was it actually turned Resolution 9 on its head. It, 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 it showed the foolishness and stupidity of using these things as, uh, as analytical tools. And Shenvey saying that, trying to say that, oh, Tom Askell, Resolution 9, he's downplaying Resolution 9. Resolution 9 wasn't a big deal. Tom Askell, Al Mohler, they would have even gone with it if you had just said that, that it, they came from these ungodly worldviews or uh, non-Christian worldviews. And that's just not, that's not the case. <laughs> that's not what Tom Askell was trying to do, which, okay, you can misunderstand. I get that. But why try to downplay the Resolution 9? Why, why do that? And, and this is where I think people on the SBC side that are in the establishment, the evangelical industrial complex, they like Neil because he defends some of the things they do. And I'll give you some more examples of that. Um, he defended Jarvis Williams' use of critical theory. So, so check this out. Uh, so Tim Dukeman asks, so will you call for Jarvis Williams to be fired from his professor position at S Southern? Neil Shenby says, no, why would I? He and lots of other evangelicals have said he finds critical race theory useful. But as far as I know, he hasn't said anything heretical. This either means that he embraces the core unbiblical tenets of critical race theory, but hasn't followed them to their logical conclusions, or that he rejects the core unbiblical tenets of critical race theory. Now, this is interesting because... This is the same Jarvis Williams who, if you watch the Enemies Within the Church montage, which came out before this, and Neil saw it because he commented on it in his Facebook group, uh, where Jarvis Williams is saying, fight for penal substitution, the same uh, racial reconciliation, the same way you'd fight for penal substitution. They're on the, that same level, that gospel issue level. Same Jarvis Williams who put out, uh, you can go look at it online, a, a, um, a syllabus, which someone leaked, but he gave it to his students, where he's promoting a lot of these woke ideas. Same Jarvis Williams who said at the Gospel Coalition blog, I wish Christians would read Delgado's critical race theory. Not because they want to oppose it for apologetic reasons, but because there's useful things to glean. That's why. Positive reading of it. And Shenvey's saying, yeah, that's not a problem. That's, that's fine. Uh, evangelicals finding CRT useful. You could find critical race theory useful. Neil Shenvey saying it right, right there. Um, it's interesting to me. Uh, he's the guy that's going to oppose this stuff, but he thinks Christians can can at least find some some useful things in it. Shouldn't be confusing the relationship of critical theory and postmodernism. So this is a, a black hole that I don't want to get into because I'm already over the time I wanted to uh, spend on this video. But Shenby says that it's common to confuse critical theory and postmodernism, but they're distinct. In particular, critical theory is not relativistic. It believes deeply in the objective reality of oppression and the objective righteousness of its aims. Uh, um, I'll make my comments brief, but... Postmodernism is not necessarily, uh, what's the word he uses? He says um, relativistic. It, it, it's subjective, but it doesn't have to be. There's different versions of postmodernism too, but it doesn't have to be relativistic. In fact, um, there, there's, it's not value-free. It's very value-laden, all right, postmodernism. Um, because, it, it, I mean, that's inescapable. All <laughs> philosophies of life have to have a value system of some kind. Um, so postmodernists uh, are uh, skeptical of uh, the overarching narratives. They're, they, they, they want um, truth is defined by individuals or groups of individuals. Um, it's very man-centered. Um, so, so yes, that's not the same thing as critical theory. In fact, uh, critical theory um, is based on, it's built on a foundation, though, of postmodernism. It accepts the metaphysic of postmodernism. Critical theory is um, pushing a, a, um, a value theory, though, that is Marxist. So the Marxist value theory is on the engine of postmodern metaphysics. Um, and, and, of course, postmodern epistemology. That is indisputable. I mean, standpoint epistemology is the foundation of critical theory. So you can't have one. It, this is like saying, well, it's common to confuse you know, Christian belief with the Bible <laughs> as a foundation or something. It's like, yeah, I guess they're different things. Christianity and the Bible are in different categories, but, um, or, you know, biblical truth or something, but yeah, they're very connected here. 
And, and that's very important to see that. And the, and the reason I think he put this out like right after Danny Aiken had said something that was basically in line with standpoint epistemology. I think we do better when we sit down to read the Bible and we have brothers and sisters coming from all different ethnicities, all different socioeconomic standings, because they're going to have insights into this infallible, inerrant text mm. that I, for example, will miss simply because of who I am, where I've lived, right. where I was born, what I've studied, and who I'm influenced by. And Shenvey did not want to condemn that. He wanted to def kind of defend that or deflect from it. And, uh, and so this, this may have been what he was tweeting about. I'm not sure. But, um, but th th this certainly muddies the waters. Uh, describe the relationship. There is a relationship. Just saying they're di they, they are distinct. But, but desc that, describe the relationship. They don't contradict one another, which is what he's making out. They, they definitely do not. Um, he also conflates culture and ethnicity. I'm not going to read you all of this. You can screenshot it and go back and read it if you want. But um, I think Bill Roach responded very well uh, to this. Neil Shenvey's trying to say that um, ethnicity correlates with culture and culture uh, does influence our presupposition. So he's saying he's trying to defend Danny Aiken. And Neil Shenvey's trying to do gymnastics to defend this. Well, certain ethnicities correlate with cultures. And cultures influence our presuppositions. And because cultures can do that, well, then cultures... Uh, you get more people, they're going to see different things, they're going to come up with a better reading. And all, ultimately, the problem with all this is that what Danny Aiken was saying was, was, was out of a standpoint epistemology playbook. He's saying that's how you get a better reading. That's, we, we, we're going to necessarily have a better reading the more diverse perspectives that we have represented interpreting the Bible. No. Um, in fact, if you had the author there who is the only uh, perspective, you're going to get the best perspective right? Um, in fact, you start adding perspectives, you're going to get a worse perspective because you're going to get away from what the author was saying, perhaps. He, he knows what he said. And so um, adding perspectives, uh, here, here's the truth in that. The truth is that sometimes people, because of their cultures, because of they emphasize different things, they see different things, yeah, they can notice things that others would not notice. That is possible. That's not just cultures, though. That's professions. That's, um, that's all kinds of factors can go into that. Uh, but 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 you wouldn't um, do this in any other field. You wouldn't you wouldn't say, well, you know what? We're gonna have the best best brain surgery ever if we just get people from all sorts of different cultural backgrounds. No, you want a good brain surgeon, and it is very possible that there will be some observations that some brain surgeons, because of the way they grew up, will see that others will not. That could happen, but ultimately, that's not. You're not shooting for. Um, diversity to make something uh, accurate or, or to get the best reading on something, to interpret something. Uh, you're, you're shooting for a, uh, a way in which, a mechanism in which, an interpretation method in which you can ascertain the objective truth of the authorial intent. What did the author mean? That is That should be the focus. The focus should never be the diversity of perspectives and then just assuming that you're going to get a better reading. You may get a way worse reading doing that. You may get perspectives that are way off in left field, but you're including them because, well, they're just a different culture or something. So that, that's the problem with Danny Aiken's statement. Neil Shenvey wants to do gymnastics to defend this. Bill Roach, I mean, just, I mean, he says, what, what about Socrates? You have faithful Greek during his time. Uh, he was ethnically Greek, but viewed as an outcast. So was he a faithful Greek? No, they didn't see him that way. Um, so ethnic, ethnicity, culture, the ways of thinking, these are all... You can't just put these all on a ball and, and say and wrap it up and say they're all the same thing. They're not. They're not. And so this is just this is rudimentary level mistakes. So it's important I say this uh, at this juncture again. Uh, and I need to repeat it probably. I can make mistakes, right? I'm not beyond that. You can make mistakes. So I'm not trying to slam Neil here. I'm not trying to say that you know Neil is just uh, inept on this issue and you should never listen to anything he says. Um, I'm j I just want to recognize that he has some limitations that would would preclude me from recommending his resources for the purpose of interpreting or understanding critical theory. Um, could you use his stuff for research? I'm sure you can. And does that mean he'll continue? You know, I'll continue to think that. Probably, maybe not. Maybe he's, I'm sure, learning and growing, and hopefully he puts out some material uh, in time uh, that, uh, that doesn't have these limitations. But at this point, there, there are some limitations there in his understanding of this. And, um, and again, he, he's way smarter than me, I'm sure, on, on some areas. I think he's a, um, uh, he's a scientist of some kind, or that's his background. I think he's a molecular biologist or a physicist or a chemist. Or, I forget, but, 
But look, he knows a lot more than me on some things. Very intelligent guy, I'm sure. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he he has limitations in this area. So so that's that's all I'm trying to say. And, and this is for the sake of discernment. I know his stuff is recommended a lot. I would just be um, I'd be careful of making him like the go-to guru uh, of critical theory, at least at this point. Now, speaking of, of go-to guru, gurus, uh, James Lindsay is considered by many to be the world expert now on critical theory. Um, uh, New discourses, I think, is his website. He's got the the whole uh, like a dictionary of um, social justice terminology. Really bright guy, and uh, not a Christian. Bright guy though, and he actually got into the fray on this Danny Aiken thing. He's the one. He, he actually posted the video of Danny Aiken talking about uh, interpreting the Bible, and he says the question is what kind of specific perspective come along with being a white male or black lesbian? We all have biases, but why should we assume? that those are sources of bias. And what do those biases reflect? Theory isn't ambiguous on this, but we can ask. So he's saying, you know, why why just assume that these external qualities are the sources of a bias when reading a text? That bias necessarily comes from your ethnicity, for instance. So if if you're black, you necessarily are going to read something differently. That's something that critical theory isn't silent on. There's a reason someone would think that, because they bought into this idea that there is a standpoint of epistemology, your social group determines this lens you read everything through. And and social groups can be uh, all sorts of different external qualities. And, and of course, ad infinitum, (laughs) infinitum. I mean, it can be... um, it can be because you know, of intersectionality. It can be the fact that you're left-handed. You're at a disadvantage, so you're going to look at the world differently. It could be all sorts of things. So, so he's saying that this isn't an ambiguous thing. And so Neil Shenvey, it's just interesting the way he responds to this. He says, well, after listening to the clip, I think the main criticism that could be lodged is that it's arguably essential, essentialized as attributes like ethnicity. In principle, there's no reason to think that a black woman will necessarily have a different set of assumptions than a white man. On the other hand, since culture does correlate with attributes like ethnicity or nationality or geography, it is legitimate to think that these factors can influence how we interpret evidence. What, I, what I'm missing is how this connects to subjectivism, saying that we all have blind spots and will be better able to see them if we interact with people who don't share our views does not commit us to any kind of relativism, right? And of course, I've already explained that's not, that's, that's true, but that's not as far as Danny Aiken's going here. Um, the issue is, what would make, let's, let's bring the brain surgery example back up. What would make a brain surgeon from the Philippines and a brain, surgery, a brain surgeon from the United States who, let's say, one's female, one's male, one's left-handed, one's right-handed, one's introverted, one's extroverted, etc. Different languages they speak. What would make them uh, different, better at their job, let's say, better at doing brain surgery? What if they're, what if they're the same? What if they have the exact same skills? Uh, exact same training, exact same skills. Well, what what's the the factor that made them the same, despite all these supposed uh, the, these external qualities that should make their their reading of the t- the textbooks on brain surgery different and the way they approach it different, etc. Well, the, the the difference is they're applying the same scientific principles because those are objective, right? Those don't change, and hermeneutical principles are are the same way. Uh, the way that you read literature, those rules of interpretation, they don't change, and so someone who lives in a different geographic area, who is a different ethnicity, etc. cetera, uh, that's the issue. They can read it the same way because they're applying the tools in a cons- in consistent fashion. And so bringing up, uh, disregarding that level of training, that level of understanding, and then just bringing up ethnicity as if that's the factor, that's the most important one. That's what Danny Aiken seems to do here. That this is the, this is the thing that uh, we're going to get a better reading from. We just, different people of different uh, ethnicities reading this. And maybe he'll maybe maybe you know if he thought through it he'd say oh, okay well training would help you know but he's still saying that training with ethnicities that's a that's a prominent factor in this um, the the ethnic makeup so yeah it can be true that people can come at things from a different worldview uh, and they can notice different things but the point is if you're going to be good at your job then you're going to understand these principles that are part of the fabric of reality, and you're going to be able to apply them well, and you can overcome whatever cultural barriers uh, that might be you know, in existence in your community in order to do that. That's accessible information for anyone. That's the point. Um, and, and so Neil Shenby wants to carve out this space for Danny Aiken somehow to, to read this in a way that you know he's sort of trying to agree with James Lindsay, but he's saying, but on the other hand, <laughs> there's reason to think 
that uh, culture does correlate with ethnicity. So it can be legitimate to think that these factors can influence how we interpret evidence. Well, that's not, yeah, yeah, they, they can, but <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, where's your authority? Where are you going to to figure out what a text means? Are you going to a panoply of um, different ethnicities to figure out what the better reading is? Or are you going to people who understand hermeneutical principles well? And, and so th this would destroy, obviously, hard sciences. Brain surgery is the one I like to use because it, it makes sense. This, you, you would be very uncomfortable if you had a panel of different ethnicities and the training was secondary. But they're going to make the de decision on what to do about your brain surgery. You, you, you'd be frightened. You want, you know, even if it's one person, you want someone who knows how to do it, knows the science behind it, all right? All right, um, we're going to switch some gears here. Before I do, though, I just, we're going to cap this with, again, uh, I, I wasn't planning on doing this today, but I did get some questions. And I, I think because a lot of Neil's stuff is shared now a lot, I think it is important that I should at least address it. You know, I'm not trying to... Um, just be silent and, and not endorse Neil's stuff because I'm, I'm a big meanie or something like that, or he's in com competition. Look, I don't have a problem endorsing. I, I endorse a lot of other people's stuff. Um, in fact, I did that at the beginning of this, this program. Uh, I, I, I love uh, a lot of the stuff Sovereign Nations puts out on this subject. Um, I think I, I would say if you want to understand critical theory, I think James Lindsay's a great person to go to on this. But um, I, I think there's some limitations right now with Neil's understanding. And I don't know, I'm not attributing any motives. He may be very well-meaning. He may be very nice and um, really have a heart to, to uh, take, uh, take this issue on because he sees some of the bad abuses. But what I notice is he goes for the, the, the more extreme elements, though the ones that are more consistently in that critical race theory model. And he kind of gives a pass or he doesn't talk about those who platform him. And so that that's something that I think you should at least just be aware of. And so um, so I would be open to talking to to people more about this, and I'd be open to Neil critiquing this if he wants to critique it. Um, I like I said, nothing personally against him at all. Um, so let, let's uh, switch gears here now. Let's go to John MacArthur and uh, and and what what he said. This is last year. I don't think I really understood in seminary how relentless this battle would be and how much discernment it would take, and how it would affect relationships. How many relationships eventually look, look like they're going the right direction, but are sacrificed to an unwillingness to do battle. And you wind up sort of at the end of your life having been stripped of people who at some point gave in to the other side, and the ranks get thinner and thinner. Um, I'm sort of living in that era. I'm, I'm living in an era, on one hand, as a shepherd and a pastor, where I have 50 years of loving people who uh, have filled my life with so much love and so much kindness and so much affection that it's just beyond comprehension. And that's Grace Church, and that's the people who hear the Word of God and believe it and follow it. But on the other hand, I, I watch my life as it comes to an end being stripped of relationships with many, many evangelical leaders, because at some point they're unwilling to stand where I stand. They, they will call up and ask, how do we re-engage with MacArthur? What, what, what did we do? Um, and it really comes down to uh, whether or not you're a faithful soldier. Now, it's interesting he said that a year ago, right, or not, not even quite a year ago. This is what he said recently after this whole issue with Grace Community Church opening up and being threatened by Los Angeles. This is what he said. People don't want to take a stand. Look, I'll be very specific. The last couple of days we've been dealing with this issue. A lot of you know, evangelical leaders across the country that I know, and not one of them that is a prominent person has contacted me to say thank you. Because if you're, if you're not everything that, that the pragmatic evangelical movement thinks you need to be, you're like a pariah. We can't associate with you because yeah. that's not going to work out there because if the world doesn't like you, they aren't going to like Jesus. Does that bother you at all? Does that bother you? This is a, a watershed moment in my opinion. Um, th this just shows kind of where the evangelical industrial complex is at. The people that you might have thought were solid, a lot of them. 
Uh, and I'm not going through a whole deep dive into who's supporting MacArthur and who's not. I'll tell you what, though. Here's one person. Here's one person who's supporting him. Rodney Howard Brown. I think he's a prosperity preacher. So uh, if that, I don't know a lot about him. He's one of the guys, though, that initially in this whole thing in Florida wanted to remain open, his church. Now, as far as I know, he's, he's part of that American gospel, kind of probably not a, not a good guy in the sense of understanding Orthodox theology. Um, I don't know a lot about him, but he may be even a false teacher. But this is what he said. Look, Pastor John MacArthur is not a fan of mine. However, he is a brother. I am praying for him and his church this weekend as they come against this communist agenda to shut down the church. May God strengthen and embolden him. If we don't hang together, we will hang separately. Now, I happen to know this one thing about Rodney Howard Brown. because Someone told me this. He did come from South Africa. He knows what communism can look like. I think he wrote a book on it. My friend was telling me. This is this is peak 2020. You have Rodney Howard Brown, who's totally, I mean, he would, I think he was called out at the Strange Fire conference. He's coming out in support of John MacArthur. And where are John MacArthur's alleged friends? The people he talked about at the Shepherd's Q&A panel over a year ago, where he said, I'm not going to go after my friends. And over and over, they go after him, sometimes in roundabout ways, but Lincoln Duncan did it after the Beth Moore go home statement. Um, Mark Dever just backed up Jonathan Lehman for Jonathan Lehman's um, questioning of MacArthur's decision. Um, Al Mohler has, has been nowhere to be found, it seems like, <laughs> on any of these issues to defend John MacArthur. Yet he'll defend Southern Baptists till the cows come home uh, on, on everything that uh, is going on in the convention. So w- what is going on? Uh, and of course, Al Mohler, too, I should mention, I uh, said in the last podcast, but he, he just in a backhanded way came out against John MacArthur and without mentioning his name, but calling in the context of talking about MacArthur opening up, warning about malpractice, church, church malpractice. What's going on out there? What's going on? Um, it can be discouraging. And, and, uh, and, and so I, I understand that. I'm fully aware of that. Um, there's a lot of other things too that could be discouraging. Here's here's one thing uh, I, I found about out about this uh, this morning, and I guess this was a decision from June. This is just tip of the iceberg, just a little example of what's going on out there. Rutgers English Department, Rutgers uh, University English Department responds to Black Lives Matter. Here's one of the things they they've done. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to read this whole thing, but here's here's the thing that stood out mostly: incorporating critical grammar into our pedagogy. This approach challenges the familiar dogma that writing instruction should limit emphasis on grammar sentence level issues so as to not put students from multilingual non-standard academic English backgrounds at a disadvantage. Instead, it encourages students to develop a critical awareness of the variety of choices available to them with regard to micro level issues in order to empower them and equip them to push against biases based on written accents. Let me, let me uh, cut through this for you. The standard grammar, standard American grammar, uh, we shouldn't enforce that so heavily. This, this is this is where this is edu- this is Rutgers University. <laughs> this is Rutgers saying this that they're going to incorporate critical grammar, critical so criticize grammatical structures, the way grammar is constructed. I mean, you don't get much more postmodern than this. Um, s- grammar and sentence level issues. They don't want to put students from disadvantaged backgrounds, which are multilingual, non-standard academic English backgrounds at a disadvantage. This is, we're destroying standards. We are destroying standards. And what is this going to do? I had an engineer friend of mine reach out to me. Uh, I, if I said who he was, he'd probably be fired <laughs> if someone found this clip. But he reached out to me and said, look, we, we are involved in, um, in producing some stuff for like important stuff for aircraft, kind of imp- important. He goes, I'm afraid of what's happening because we're making our decisions now based on things like uh, who, who's a minority owned business, uh, who's a gay owned business. We got to do business with them. Um, the all, all the training that they get, the sensitivity training. And he said, look, our, our quality is going down. It's happening. Production and quality are going down. It's just the quality is not there. What is this doing to our country in ways that we don't see right now, but we're going to find out about in probably about five to 10 years. It's changing us. This whole movement is changing us. So there, there's that's going on. Uh, and if you weren't worried about that, the national debt. Now, I just took this screenshot um, a couple hours ago, but uh, national debt, uh, 
26 over over 26 and a half trillion right we we were upset when it was less than half of that when obama got into office right 2009 12.3 12.3 trillion and we had a tea party people were enraged it's it's more than half of more than twice that number now where's the tea party we just almost spent we and it didn't pass. I don't know what they're in negotiations still, I guess, in the in Congress, but another stimulus? Remember when Obama passed a stimulus? I, I just I can't believe what I'm seeing. Things are changing so quick. Republicans are caving on so many core things right now. Here's one that I, I may talk about later in this week, but some of you may not think this is a big deal. I, I see this as a Trojan horse. The bill is called H.R. 7608, State Foreign Operations, Agricultural, uh, Rural Development, Interior Environment, Military Construction, Veterans Affairs Appropriations Act 2021. And here's the long and short of it. Um, one of the sections, two of the sections, talk about the removal of Confederate commemorative works, including flags and uh, monuments, and then an inventory of assets with Confederate names. Now, why would you take an inventory? Well, to see what you possibly would remove in the future. That's the reason. And so the people at, that are tour guides at Gettysburg are upset about this. And I don't have a lot of compassion because where were they? Where, where have they been in the last few years? But now it's going to affect their job because... If you've been to a battlefield, you know monuments tend to commemorate places where actual things took place. So it's the historical landscape. It's That's where that happened. And sometimes, yeah, this, oftentimes, actually, they, they will commemorate in such a way that shows the positive nature of sacrifice, of her heroism, etc. It'll depict soldiers sometimes uh, marching into battle on both sides. Uh, and and, and I mean, these are men who died, who sacrificed. And um, this could potentially start the process of removing those things from battlefields. I, I didn't think I would see this, honestly. Um, I, I thought they would be safe at battlefields for a while at least. This is quick. And it shows me how quick things are moving. I don't know how much longer founding father stuff is. I mean, once this stuff comes down, what's next? I mean, Trump has been the one making this argument. He said, you know, people who support Robert E. Lee, they're, his memory, they're, they're not bad, bad people necessarily just because of that. He said that, you know, Robert E. Lee was a good general. He's the only one I see pushing back on any of this. Uh, the Republican Party has been, I mean, they've adopted um, poison, in my opinion, absolute poison. Because, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because what the Republican Party is doing is they're trying to say the scapegoat for all of America's sins are the, is the Democratic Party. They're the party of the KKK and oppression and gangsters and etc. And the Republican Party was born out of anti-slavery. It's the good party. They passed civil rights and Ronald Reagan. Boom, boom, boom. That's the Republican Party. Except it's not true. That's not an accurate depiction of history. That has holes in it everywhere. Um, were, were you going to throw Thomas Jefferson away? He was a Democratic Republican. Democrats claimed him for a long time. That's why they had the Jefferson-Jackson dinners. Um, you're going to throw away um, you know, all the Republicans during the, uh, the, the, the wars out west. The, the, uh, I mean, who's it? Sherman? General Sherman, I think. After you know, the Union Army had taken over the South, they went out west, and because the Republican Party was born out of an effort to expand west and infrastructure projects, kind of like the old Whigs, American system, Henry Clay stuff, but they wanted the west for free white labor. Oh, there's a lot of a lot of quotations I can give you on this, and um, and, and of course the railroad was part of this as well. But uh, they they went out, they made war. A lot of the Native Americans put them on reservations. That's those. Republican administrations, the Union Army that had conquered the South goes out West and does this kind of thing. Um, are, are we, just, you know, you just want to own that? Say, you know, so proud to be a Republican. I'm, and I, I'm not doing this to um, blast the Republican Party. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think I am a registered Republican. I, I, I moved and I, I was a registered conservative in New York. I think I'm, I'm a Republican here. But, um, but here, here's the thing, though. You, you, playing identity politics with our ancestors is not a good idea because when the Republicans start down this road and they start finding out, wow, look what Abraham Lincoln said on race. You don't think Lincoln's going to be canceled. You don't think that some of the heroes that you have are going to come down as well. The difference between Democrats and Republicans is Democrats don't care about throwing their ancestors under the bus. They can rename, they'll throw Woodrow Wilson under the bus. He was a progressive, but they don't care because the Democrats are progressives they are progressing, and everything from the past is barbarism. We'll get rid of it. That's fine. They canceled the Jefferson-Jackson dinners. They're not proud of those guys anymore. The Republican Party is different. They actually do want to hang on to heritage somehow, but they're doing it in a bad way. <laughs> they're doing it by 
twisting the narrative of history to just blast Democrats and make Democrats responsible for all the national quote unquote sins. And I'm, I'm sorry, but the, the parties that existed a hundred years ago are not the same as the parties that exist now. And, and I can recognize that the Democrats today are communists and realize that they weren't the same Democrats during the time of Andrew Jackson. In fact, they were more so the party of small government at that time uh, in, in um, comparison uh, to the Whig. Now, of course, Jackson won a national bank and so forth, but, uh, but they're, 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 the differences aren't, they're, there really isn't a, um, a, a tradition that they stand in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has been taken over by revolutionaries. And Republicans don't seem to understand this. They think, they project, they think the, Repu the Democrats care about their history as much as they care about theirs. That's just not true. It's just not true. So you start down this road of um, something that could have possibly offend someone being ha having to be removed, possibly. Uh, you, you, that there's no end to, to where that acid will eat. And I'll tell you what this is. This is cancel culture. And this started, I think, with millennials mostly when they started on MySpace years ago and Facebook, um, deleting all the pictures of ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends as if it never happened down the memory hole, right? And, and you probably did that too, <laughs> if you're listening, right? Um, it, it's because you had, the reason you would have done that was because you had a negative association with them. It was embarrassing. You didn't want to be associated. Well, who's going to want to be associated with bigoted history? I mean, Colonial Williamsburg is already having problems keeping alive <laughs> financially. People aren't going to want to go to these places. And more Southerners go to Gettysburg than Northerners. Take down all those Southern monuments. You think people are going to show up? And if we forget our history, we're not going to have an identity. Marxists understand that. They do. That's why Marx uh, believed that history was the chief discipline. The chief of the sciences was, dis was history. And, and that's the first thing that you do is indoctrinate the children. Give them, make, give them negative associations of things that they used to be proud of, sacrifice and heroism of these guys. Well, now they're looking at them and they're just thinking, well, these are just a bunch of racists. That's all they are. That's a one-dimensional view. And, and so we're gonna, we, we need to take them down. It's offensive. It might offend me if I look at it. Well, if we start doing that, what are the negative associations with Thomas Jefferson going to do? Or what about our, our own little ventures into uh, colonialism with the Spanish-American War and Hawaii and et cetera? What, do, do, do we just rip down uh, Republicans from history? What do we do with uh, Teddy Roosevelt? I mean, I know what's happening in New York City, right? I don't know if they are, if they've taken him down or not. They, they were the big statue and they wanted to take down. So, so where does this end? Where does this end, guys? And I would encourage you, talk to your senator if you're concerned about this, because this is the beginning of the end. This is how this works. And this has happened. I started reading a book on, on Mao's China during the Cultural Revolution. It's the same playbook in, so, in many ways. Um, so so I, I'll probably talk more about history because we, we need to be able to respond to these things. Pe Well-meaning people, useful idiots, really. That's the term. Not my term, but a term that I've heard used that uh, I don't... I, I think is accurate. People who have good intentions, well, it offends someone. We got to take it down. We need to know how to respond to those people, and um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do some of that uh, as well because um, this stuff just eats away at authorial intent. It, it'll come for Christianity, the quote unquote white man's religion, according to social justice warriors, and and we won't have an answer for it if we if we buy into it now. Let's not buy into it. Let's draw the line and say, look, I don't. I'm from Idaho. Like <laughs> I don't have any connection to this. Look, I grew up in upstate New York. Um, I, but, but I, I have, I can see where this is going and I probably will contact my, uh, Senator about this. Uh, some hopeful things. I want to end on a high note. Uh, first of all, let's, let's do this first. First Kings nineteen eighteen. yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Guys, you're not alone. A lot of people like you, people that are leaving churches. I get the emails all the time. We're creating right now. Uh, so a network that will help connect you to, with others of like mind and faith. And hopefully we'll go around the institutions to plant some good churches. So I'm encouraged by some movement I see in that area. Uh, it might be a few months before that whole thing is up, but we're, but we're working. Um, also, Russell Fuller has, and I'll put the link in the info section. I'll put a bunch of stuff there for you. Uh, he started his theology classroom. This is a good first step with getting around the institutions and starting some good theological education. Now, it's on the ground floor. I mean, this is the beginning, but uh, I, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. Um, I also heard, I think it was yesterday, 
I think it was Tennessee, passed a heartbeat bill, which might not go as far as many of us want, but uh, it's a step in a direction which should be interesting, uh, undermining Roe v. Wade and abortion. Uh, so we praise God for that. There, there are some good, good things going on. There's some people out there trying to do some good things. And, uh, and I don't want to forget about all of that. Uh, and we should, we should never. But we do need to be aware of the tsunami that is coming our way. Uh, that, that ever increases. And, and it does bother me. It does bother me to see um, all these men who I thought were solid years ago, not either they're silent or they're just not going to stand with John MacArthur on something so basic as being able to meet as a church. So um, so, so those are my thoughts uh, for this weekend. A uh, bunch of stuff for, for next week. We'll see how far I get. But um, appreciate all your prayers. Uh, again, once again, for my father-in-law, it does mean a lot. God bless you all. Have a good weekend.